welcome back here to Giza in Egypt. Behind me you see of course the pyramids here and to my left a valley that's now filled with homes but they still have some of the farmland and the beautiful plants and trees that have always dotted this landscape. The Nile River used to come up very close to these pyramids. That's actually how they got these huge limestone blocks to this position to make these pyramids more than 4,000 years ago. And as we remember in our geography, Cairo or Giza, which is right across the Nile from Cairo, is right in the Nile Delta. Now further up in this Delta, just very, very close to here, is a place called Goshen. Goshen is where the Hebrews lived, where the Israelites lived, and where they came out in Exodus. But I think most of us have this question in our minds, how on earth did they get there? Many of us, since we were children, have heard the stories from the Old Testament. We heard the stories of the Israelites coming here and how the Hebrews were freed. But I think it's important as we begin this Lenten journey to look at those stages and maybe identify a few characteristics that can help us in our own Lenten journey, this Lenten pilgrimage of freedom. So what happens from the beginning of Joseph's life? Let's remember that his father is actually named Jacob. I'm going to go through the line of salvation history because this is important for us as we go through Lent. It's all about us entering into salvation history. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob wrestled the angel and the angel was overcome, as it says, not only in scripture, but also you too writing a song about that scripture passage. And when he wrestled that angel, that angel changed his name, it was actually God who wrestled with him, changed his name to Israel because Israel means the one who wrestles with God. And so Jacob's name was changed to Israel. He had many sons. Of those sons, 12 of them became the 12 tribes or the 12 sons of Israel or of Jacob. And so the 11th of those sons is Joseph. Joseph had a little brother named Benjamin who was born of the same wife, Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel and uh, he was born much later and eventually Rachel died. But it says in Genesis chapter 37 that he was the favorite son of his father. It sounds a lot like salvation history. The son of the father, the favorite son. We could even call that Christ himself. But each one of us enter into the sonship. So he was a son and it says in 37 verse three, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his children because he was the son of his old age. So there was great love there. And then it says later in this uh, chapter of Genesis that his father made him a coat, a coat of many colors, as it even says in a Broadway musical. This is such an important story for our culture and for our lives and for salvation history. And what happened because of that? This is where sin enters into the story of Joseph. What is this? His brothers were jealous of him, it says, in verse 11. They were jealous of him not just because his father loved him more than the rest, not just because he received the coat, but because Joseph also had a very special quality. And this is something that we can ask for during this Lent. And that is the grace of listening to the voice of God himself in our hearts. This is the Holy Spirit who's working in us and, you know, bringing us along this pathway of salvation. He was a dreamer. And if you remember, it says in this chapter of Genesis that he had a dream that all of his brothers would bow down before him and that he would be a ruler over them. So this is what it says. What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and my mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept him always in mind. So because they were shepherds, he went off to find his brothers when they were... Um, you know, took its sheep down to Shechem. That's actually by the place of the woman of the well, just to give you an idea of the geography. And what happened when he goes down there? Sin continues to go deeper into the lives of these brothers. They saw him from a distance. And when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore. And they took him and they cast him deep into a pit. And then it says they had lunch. Yeah. Then, just as you can see behind me, a lot of these caravans, these, if you, as they say in the Bible, the Ishmaelites, they were making a caravan journey down to Egypt. And they said, why should we uh, hurt him? Let us sell him. And this is what it says. His brothers listened to the suggestion of Reuben. They lifted him up out of the pit and they sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. 
So this is where we begin this whole process, not just of sin, but of slavery. He was sold to be brought down here to Egypt. This is how he came. And this is a very important thing for us to remember. What is happening during this Lent? I have to go back into my own mind and heart and prayer. How did I get to where I am? What is my family history? But most importantly, what is my own history? What are the things that have been going on in my own heart? The sinful thoughts, the sinful actions. Who have I sold into slavery? Who have I hurt? In fact, it goes further. If you remember here in Genesis, it says um, they had to give their father an excuse as to why their, his favorite son would not return. And it says they took his robe and they dipped it into animal's blood and they, you know, just mangled it. And they took it home and they said to his father, this we have found. See now whether this is your son's robe or not. So Jacob, Joseph's father said, he tore his garments and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. This indeed is my son. He was absolutely devastated. So now let's add another sin. They lied. And they lied not just to a friend or to themselves. They lied to their very father. They lied to the head of the tribe. And it says his father wept for him. So then what happens to Joseph? If you continue to read verse 37, it ends saying that the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar. And Potiphar was the officer to Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. So here he is in slavery. Now, if we continue, we know that he was sold, but there's something that happens when we enter into this journey of salvation and that a sin brings us blessing. But how does that happen? Well, it happens when we are faithful to the Lord, not just to the voice that we might hear, like Joseph who dreamt many dreams, but when we follow what we know the Lord wants us to do. And this is what it says in chapter 39. Joseph was taken down to Egypt. He was with Potiphar. The Lord was with him, it says in chapter 39, verse 2. And it says in verse 3, his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hands. And so Joseph found favor with him. In fact, it says, uh, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. So not only was he sold into something that was in terrible slavery, he had a lot of responsibilities. He was blessed, his master was blessed, and his entire household was blessed. Let's continue on this pathway. Joseph um, was a handsome young man, it says, and Potiphar's wife actually lusted after him. Let's add another one of these sins, sins that we'll go back to as soon as we go to the mountain of Sinai. Sins that the Lord recognizes, sins that the Lord will help us to overcome with his grace with the Ten Commandments. But this is what it says in chapter, uh, chapter 39, verse 7. His master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and said, lie with me. Why does Joseph not do that? He says, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? His mind was clear. His, his life was upright. He lived that upright life that you can see in the different temples and stuff that we'll go and see in further further in Egypt toward the south. But what happened is his wife then told Potiphar, Potiphar put him into prison. He took him, it says, and put him into prison, but in prison. Again, sold, betrayed, imprisoned. There's another lie there. He was betrayed, but he was blessed because the king's prisoners were confined in this prison. And if you remember, it continues to talk about in verse 40, that there was a baker, the Pharaoh's baker, and his cupbearer. They're also in prison with him. Why do I bring that up? Because it says that the Lord was with Joseph in prison. And so when this baker and this cupbearer had dreams that they didn't understand, because the prisoner, the head of the prison, saw Joseph was so blessed and put him in charge of taking care of the prisoners and working with them and organizing them, they said, Joseph, well, Joseph said, I can help you to interpret your dreams. And so he again is faithful to the Holy Spirit. The Lord was working inside. So they both dreamt and they were confined in prison, but Joseph gave them the meaning. And the meaning was confirmed because one of them uh, was killed and the other one was reinstituted in Pharaoh's home. So this actually confirmed the fact that the Lord was with Joseph. 
Joseph actually asked the baker, or excuse me, the cupbearer who was reinstated to remember him when he goes back to the palace. He was forgotten. Even though he was blessed, even though the Lord was with him, he was forgotten. And it says in chapter 41, he was forgotten for two full years. Okay, that's a long journey. That's a long time to be in prison. But finally, it's when the Pharaoh has a dream after those two years, and then the cupbearer says, no one else can interpret those dreams, not your magicians, not your counselors, not your advisors. There's a man in prison who actually interpreted mine. The Lord is with him. So this recognition of God's blessing and the Lord's uh, being with him is just expanded. It just keeps going out further and further. And so it says in uh, verse 14, Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. They brought him out and Joseph was able to tell Pharaoh. But this is what he says when Pharaoh asks him to do him this favor. It is not on me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer to his question. So again and again, because of the fidelity of Joseph, God is becoming glorified. After Joseph uh, was able to interpret the dream of the Pharaoh properly, the Pharaoh was really not only impressed, but he said to his servants in uh, verse 37, can we find such a man as this in whom is the Spirit of God? Can we find such a man as this? And so these blessings are being multiplied. Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all this, there is none so discreet and wise as you are, who shall be over my house and all my people in order them as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. When we think about the pinnacle of power and majesty and glory, just look at these pyramids. They were for the pharaohs. They were for the kings. And you know what? There was only one person in that time who was greater than Joseph, the pharaoh. And this was the greatest civilization at that time. Sin, uh, being sold, slavery, uh, betrayal, um, being a prisoner. And God, when he's with you, blesses you. And this is exactly what Joseph shows us. In fact, it also says in verse 43, he not only brought Joseph and took his hand and blessed him, but he arrayed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck, showing his office. But also, that is a sign for the dignity that he is receiving. No longer a prisoner, but almost as if he is the son of Pharaoh. He set him over all of the land of Egypt. So, we all know what happens after that. Pharaoh's dream was actually about famine that was coming to the land after years and years of um, a lot of abundance. And it was on Joseph's watch that Egypt was, be, was able to have all of these storehouses filled with grain. And so, this is fascinating. When all the land of Egypt was famished, after these years of great wealth, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph. Do what he says to you. And then it says at the end of chapter 41, all the earth came up to Egypt to go to Joseph. All the earth. These blessings are being spread through all the earth. Because the whole world was coming to Joseph, because the entire area was in famine, that also meant that his brothers came down from Canaan. We all know this story very well. So his brothers were before Joseph, and what happened is he didn't believe them, or actually he made it seem like he didn't know who they were. He didn't think that they were really here um, to get grain, and so he considered them as spies. Now in this, he said, I'm not gonna give you anything unless your little brother comes, because he wanted to see his little brother. He wanted to see if his father was alive. But in that process, this is what uh, Reuben says to his brothers. Did I not tell you not to sin against the lad? but you would not listen. So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. They're beginning to see in their own hearts that they did something wrong. And so this is an entire process that the Lord is doing through them. Not only are they mm, having to wait and to beg, one of them actually has to go to prison. In fact, when they go back to um, their land, back to Canaan, uh, they tell their father that they have to go back up to get more grain eventually, and, but they have to take their little brother. And of course, he doesn't want that to happen because he thinks he lost his other son. But they go back. One of them has to stay in prison. And then they're further uh, convicted about what they did to Joseph. And they're convicted 
about the pain that it is causing their own father. Something they didn't take into account at the beginning. Again, this is a journey, it's pedagogy. The Lord himself understands. Actually, as the great teacher, he knows that we learn only when it's through a long process, through a journey. This is how we are converted and this is how we are live. We are saved and freed. So jumping toward the end of the story, I wanted to actually just quote something here in chapter 44. This is when Reuben comes and it's before Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. And he says, what can I do? We, um, there's no way we can prove that we haven't been guilty of the things you're accusing us of. But he says to Joseph, God has found out the guilt of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's slaves, both we and he also in whose hand the cup has been found. In other words, uh, you can read the whole story in chapter 45, 44. Reuben is recognizing the fact that not only has he sinned, but the sin has made him a slave. And so he's begging for mercy and he's begging for forgiveness. So finally in chapter 45 is this part of the journey, which is redemption. Remember that our end point is Easter. Our end point is salvation and freedom and redemption. And so when Joseph says, I am Joseph, he begins to ask, is my father alive? Is he alive? And then he says, so it was, um, for famine has been in the land, etc. God sent me before you to preserve you as a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you and to keep you alive for many generations. So it was not you who sent me here, but it was God. It was God. And not only that, he continues to bless him. And he says, bring everyone up, your families, your livestock, everyone that you have, and you shall dwell in the land of Goshen. You shall be near me you and your children and your children's children and your flocks, and I will provide for you. you. I will provide for you because there's still going to be famine. And you must tell my father all the splendor that there is in Egypt and how the Lord has blessed us. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt. It is yours. That's actually a quote from Pharaoh. And so you can see how not only are they blessed, but they're blessed by the highest person in the land. So in this journey, they actually end up in what we would call beatitude. Beatitude simply means you're able to see. We will eventually see the face of God. He will see our face. That's what beatitude really means. It's our full joy in that. And so um, Jacob is able to see his son again, and his son is able to see his father. So it takes us into what the promised land really is. But more than that, this blessing goes to actually beyond what he could have ever imagined, because it says that Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Jacob blessed Pharaoh. He's now not here. He's actually above all of this grandeur and this glory. And so uh, he's in that position and it ends, this whole story ends as to why he's here with them going back to the promise. We cannot forget that we are part of this promise of salvation. So what is the promise that God made to Abraham, Isaac, and to jo Jacob, and now to Joseph, and to each and every one of the members of the chosen people who were here? It's this, Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. And he said to me, behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you and will make of you and your company of peoples great. And I will give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. And Joseph asks his brothers, please do not forget to take me up or pass on to the generations in the future. Even after I die, because they actually mummified him and buried him, take me up to the land of Canaan, our land, the land that God himself promised us, this promised land. So as we make this journey through Lent, let's not forget these stages, this long journey, this difficult journey, this journey at times, which can kind of uh, make us want to give up or make us want to turn back. There is a promise there. And when we listen to God or when we try to see him working in everything, when he convicts us of sin, let's say, okay, I have sinned. I become small before you. I glorify you. I ask you to give me the grace to continue on because one day I also want to see your face and be with you in this land of milk and honey and even bless all of the world represented by blessing Pharaoh himself with the blessings of God. So with these great thoughts and I don't know, this, this passage of the Bible in our minds, I invite you to read the entire story, maybe during this Lent. And know that from here, from this place in Egypt, this beautiful desert, as we continue on our journey, we're praying for each and every one of you as we continue on our pilgrimage of Exodus, this pilgrimage of freedom. God bless you.